Hey guys, this is And The Writer Is, and I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy this podcast, please rate us on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. We really appreciate that effort. This week, we are featuring five country music hit makers in honor of the CMA Awards. The biggest stars are coming together on one stage where the heart of country music beats stronger than ever. Watch as Brad Paisley and Carrie Underwood host the 51st annual CMA Awards tonight at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock central on ABC. See powerful collaborations by Kelsey Ballerini and Reba McIntyre, Brad Paisley and Kane Brown, Marin Moore and Niall Horn, and there might even be a song that was co-written by yours truly. It's country music's night to shine, with unforgettable performances and the best of the best honored in several categories. For more information, visit cmaawards.com. Today's guest on CMA Week is Nicole Gallion. This Kansas native and Belmont University alum and Warner Chapel writer was pretty much my first co-write in Nashville. So I'm really excited to have her on. I hope you guys enjoy the show tonight. So tune in to that. Without further ado, here is And The Writer Is featuring Nicole Gallion. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. This week's writer pens Country Smashes. One of my favorite stats is that she recently became the first female to co-produce a country Billboard number one album in over 10 years. Meanwhile, in her personal life, she and her husband are the songwriting power couple, raising two children while winning country music's biggest awards. From Sterling, Kansas, this writer has become a staple in the Nashville writing community, and the writer is Instagram supermom Nicole Gallion. Oh my gosh, can you just announce me like that every morning when I wake up? That's awesome. 100%. It's going to be weird when when Rodney, your husband's going to be like, you got to get Ross out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram <laughs> super mom. Yeah. Oh, illusions, illusions. I was also th- thinking that you should absolutely have a song somewhere called The Girl from Sterling. Just the internal rhyme is, do you oh, not yeah. have that? You well, have to have I actually that, right? have a title. It's not The Girl from Sterling, but I have a book title. That's been in the back of my mind for years, and it doesn't have Sterling in it, but it's kind of reminiscent of what of Girl from Sterling. So when the music business is done with me, I'll go right. Are you that gonna book. do like a tell-all book? Um, I don't know if if there's a book long enough to tell all, but I'm definitely gonna write a book someday. Wow, have you ever? Do you do writing outside of songwriting? Well, that's kind of it's funny because b- I never thought of myself as a songwriter. I grew up like writing but never putting it with music. It was weird because I, it's so cheesy to talk about now, but I was the yearbook editor and I was the literary journal editor in high school and I worked for our small town newspaper in the summers and I would tote a camera around on my shoulder and I'd go to all of like the little um, city commission meetings and report and write write the copy for the newspapers. So I was always telling a story in one way or another and it wasn't until much later that I got to Nashville and figured out that if I just put that with piano, which I already knew how to play, that I could be a songwriter. Describe what Sterling, Kansas is. Well, it was originally named Peace, Kansas. P-E-A-C-E. Oh, that's sweet. Um, and that's kind of what it is to me. It's like, um, it's it's really like how people that are from cities, they look at like a show like, um, like the, uh, what's the, what's the, Andy, uh, Oh, Griffith. Andy Griffith show, yeah. and they go, oh, that's just in that's just in you know Mayberry is just like a a, a movie set. 
that that's not a real thing. Like that is how I grew up, and that is, and if that's not how I grew up, that's how I perceive my childhood. I have that. Oh sm- wow, yeah. Sure, I have that like small town, charmed, rose colored glasses thing about my childhood. So when did you did your parents do music? No. No, no one in my family except for my grandpa actually is from Tennessee. Um, and he and his Ed and Valina and the mountain band or something like that in East Tennessee, they would travel around and probably like a covered wagon. It was so long ago. Do you have recordings of it? I don't of them, but my, he ended up moving to Kansas and uh, marrying my grandma and they had seven kids, the youngest of which is my dad. And once like late in his life when he was like retired he would go and play at nursing homes oh cute and he made this cassette that they would sell at the nursing homes and it was all these really old time songs that I think he probably played with that band and um so that's really all that I still have left of of him did you start you were saying how you were doing you know you were into writing were you writing basically you know was it did it go from wanting to write to wanting to I don't know, pub, pub, publish your writing in a new school newspaper or whatever. How does how do you end up getting involved in actually writing for other people to read? Um, well, and it's just called small town. I right. mean, there were 2,000 people in my hometown. I graduated with 38 people. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of a small town is you get to try on every hat. There's not like, you know, you grow up in a city, you have to be the star volleyball player by the age of seven to be on a volleyball team. When you grow up in a small town, you're like, oh, debate, I want to try that. Hmm, forensics, I want to try that. Volleyball, I want to try that. And I tried everything and did everything. And writing was just something that um, I just, I didn't realize I was doing it until I really looked back. And I was like, oh, wow, wow, I did all that writing. And because I didn't, I was kind of like the anti-girl that moved to Nashville. Most girls grow up singing and wanting to perform and that gets them to Nashville and they get here and they go, oh, I need to I need to make music, I need to write my own music so that I can make a record. I was the opposite in that I was obsessed with country music and had never sung in front of anybody and had never really written a song and I was like, but I just wanted to be in the music business so I moved here and then kind of learned about songwriting and then started writing. And then through that, I kind of started singing out of necessity. So everything went backwards for me. And it's really weird now because now I'm like, it's really full circle because I've never thought of myself as a singer. I still, if if someone walks up to me now and says, oh, this is a singer songwriter. I'm like, no, I'm just a a songwriter. Just a writer. No, just a writer. I'm not a singer. Just just so you know, like everyone in this town can sing and I didn't come here to sing. That's, I don't know why I'm so stubborn about that, but it's, you know. Did your family growing up say, oh, you should sing or you should write? No, I had a choir director in high school that, because I did all the music. I did like choral music and I was, I played saxophone in the band and I played the keys image. in the jazz band. Like I did everything. Seeing, th- thinking of 38 kids and when you talk about all these things is I just uh, imagine that volleyball is half of the 38 on one side, half of the 38 yeah. on the other. And then you guys all go to cheerleading together then you all go to football together and you literally like you have to play both quarterback and cheerleader and you have to be like oh i'm gonna tell this is gonna blow your mind you're doing the journal writing of the the like the school musical while you're in it you know what i mean like she did she's amazing (laughs) in this performance you know galleon galleon starred as da 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 yeah um no i mean on a friday night though like i would take a yearbook camera to the football game over my shoulder. I mean, it was. It, it, it's like, it literally is like out of a movie. Sure. I would wear like my boyfriend who was always on the football team because, hello. And um, I would wear like his letter jacket to the football game. And then I was like the drum majorette. I would like conduct the pet band up in the stands. Dur- like pregame, like while they were warming up. Then during the game, I would go down on the side of the field with my camera and do action shots you know, for yearbook of the football game and then at halftime would perform. I mean, it was it was just like everyone wore all the hats. But I think it's really cool because you get to, there's not a lot of pressure, you know. No one was pressuring us to be the greatest in a city at something. We just got to be, you know. Did the music that you were playing in that band, was that in 
when I where I grew up, I grew up in Chicago. So, well, north suburbs of Chicago. My friends, once they visited where I was from, they were like, "You can't claim Chicago anymore." Mm-hmm. So uh, I respect that. So from the north suburbs of Chicago, the music that you'd play in jazz band or an orchestra were not really contemporary music, but that's what we learned how to play. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're playing sax in that band. Um, what kind of music are you playing in that? And are you being introduced to music outside of country? Or or is this band that when I didn't grow up in Kansas, I kind of think that you guys are playing, you know, fight songs and then also playing covers of, you know, Garth Brooks or something? No, no, no. Actually, well, first, there's two answers to this. The first part is that I started playing piano when I was like four years old, real seriously. Um, uh, the, my babysitter gave piano lessons to grade school kids in the afternoons. And so, like, she kind of had a daycare. She had a couple of us neighborhood kids. I'm sure didn't meet code or whatever you have to have now to have a daycare and home daycare. But there were four or five of us that would go there, like, in the afternoon. And then in the afternoon, she'd have, like, kids that were, like, you know, five to, like, 15 come over and take piano lessons. And I would sit on the floor and watch her give piano lessons and she would start she started kind of teaching me and then I was super serious about it and excelled at it and did competitions and all this stuff so by the time I got to like I did contests all through grade school and was real serious about it and then so when I got to middle school and like concert band was an option for the first time like Everything was really boring to me. It was very like, oh, well, I know what a scale is. I know what this is. I, you know, the, the, on a theory front, I knew music so well that I was kind of like the utility player. You know, like I, they tried to teach me to play clarinet the year we didn't have a clarinet player because it's kind of like the saxophone. And then I played timpani when we didn't have a timpani player, you know. So it was, and, and the other part to that that's interesting is that most small towns are don't have a lot of, they don't have a ton of like art artistic culture to them, but there was there's this little small like liberal arts college in my hometown. It's a private school and it's you know, it's a lot of money to go there. It's like What's it called? Sterling College. Oh, right. Well, there you go. And um and it's a lot of money to go there and so it brings it kind of keeps the dirt turned over cuz it's new families moving in all the time and you know, just looking at the demographic of the people that could afford to go to that school. They were probably coming from cities. I mean, we had, I remember we had um, a program in my small town where we would like, they were like foster children to you, like a family in town would like adopt for like while they were in college, like a, a kid from the college and they were kind of like your family, you know, you adopted Adopt-a them. Adopt a freshman. Yeah, basically. So we were meeting, like there's something very unique about my town because like arts were everything and that's not like, it's usually football. Which yeah, I was that, important too, you sure. know, and I did all that. I played volleyball and basketball and ran track, but it's it, it was really weird now that I look back because in small towns don't do that. So it was, we weren't playing Garth Brooks. Right. We were playing whatever, I don't know. We were, win- like, it was so weird. We were winning every, like, everything. Now it's just Kansas. It's not like we're, like, on the cover of Rolling Stone. But anytime we would go to, like, state whatevers and we'd always be, like, the champion. Crazy. It was weird. Yeah. Did you go to college? I did. I went to Belmont. And that's what got me to Nashville. So in my mind, my life could have gone three ways. It was either go to like Kansas State, state school, do like that thing that's kind of down the middle. And I probably would have majored in journalism. I kind of had that in the back of my mind. So you were either going to do journalism or music? Yeah, or yeah, or music business. Or Belmont oh, right, and right. come get a music business degree. And I always thought I'd be... way behind the scenes like even more than a songwriter I thought I'd be a manager or something uh, like that that's um, just because of the way how do you even know what a manager is going coming out of high school because I was a super fan so like my mom and I we and so was my mom and we came to at the time it was fanfare now it's CMA fest but back when I was like 12 13 she and I would that was my very first time on an airplane was to come to fanfare in Nashville and you would come and you would stand in line and you would get everyone's autograph and is at the fairgrounds now it's big and shiny because the cma owns it and it's at the bridge it's at the stadium downtown but it used to be like hardcore like you'd go sit on the asphalt for seven hours and wait in line to get an autograph from kenny chesney or somebody and 
I mean, they have these epic stories from fanfare where like Garth Brooks committed to like, I'm signing autographs for 24 hours and he did it. I mean, it was, I mean, fanfare was off the chain. So that's what got me to Nashville. It was super fan girl, like braids, ball cap, like just try, had a t-shirt that I was trying to get every country artist to sign. What did the t-shirt say? It just said fanfare. Right. It was just a fanfare shirt. Do you but, still have it? Oh yeah. Are you kidding? It has like a trillion autographs on it, but that's what got us here. And back when there was a tower records on West end, um, they would have these cool shows during fan fest or fanfare. And it wasn't part of fanfare, but they tower would sponsor like all these new artists and, and they would literally play in the aisles of tower records. And we saw the Dixie so chicks there. We saw Keith urban there. Like before they were big, we saw rascal flats there. We got all their autographs there. And I remember, and now looking back, I think it was probably like there were probably label people in the room because it was real small. And for those artists, it was like their first thing. And I remember standing there in line to get in and we met a woman from Kansas. So we like obviously struck up this conversation with her and she's like, oh, I'm a songwriter. And I'm like, oh, cool. So you can like move to Nashville and write songs. Cool. And that planted a seed. But I Do you had know who it was? Her name was Trina Harmon. Is she a, she's a professional she, writer? She was, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And I think, I don't think, I mean, I think she was, she's not still writing songs that I know of. I don't right. think she's like in our community. I don't even know if she lives in Nashville anymore. But, um, but we would meet people like that. We would meet managers. We would meet, you know, so we kind of, and then we went to the Rascal Flat, no, Shelly Wright fan club party. I mean, am I showing you how big of a fan That's crazy. we were? And it was at the, at the old gym at Belmont. And we, so that's where the party was. So we went on campus at Belmont to this party and we were like, look, I was looking around going, Amy Grant went to school here. Um, Brad Paisley was going to school there. Like they were like, I'm like, you can come here and you can work in the music business. So that's how. That was how old the, were you at the time? Like 13. Yeah. And I wrote a letter, my eighth grade, my eighth grade civics teacher made us all write letters to ourselves that we would open on graduation night from high school. And in that letter, I wrote it. I literally wrote, you're probably packing up your, your things right now. You're, I'm sure you're really scared, but you're about to move to Nashville. Oh, wow. And I was in eighth grade. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. So you go to Belmont. That's insane. Yeah. You go to Belmont and you get a degree in music business. Is that how that works? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you start writing songs while you're in school? Yes. I, uh, the first thing that happened for me, um, that kind of was the butterfly effect was that I got a job giving piano lessons to a manager's kids. That manager was Mark Oswald. His brother is Greg Oswald, who then hired me the summer after my freshman year of college to be his personal assistant. So I, and he was, he's an agent at William Morris. And so I kind of just got swept into his world all the new artists in town that you know that they were William Morris was courting or whatever like I was getting pulled into dinners because I was driving him there and I was meeting all these writers and artists and the first time that I sat in on a guitar pole I was like I think I can do that I don't know if I've ever sat in on a guitar pole well you have it just sounds more formal that's it's just like when when you sit around in a living room and three or four people get out, or they just pass the guitar around, and yeah, everyone. Yeah, does somebody takes yell like guitar pole? No, and everyone's like, yeah. Let's no, run they into don't the yell room. guitar <laughs> pole. It just starts like somebody you know, just pulls some, out a guitar somewhere. One of those, one of those artists or singer songwriters is just drunk enough to just sit on, you know, sit in, sit back in a recliner with a guitar and starts playing, and then everyone's into Do it. Do you remember any of the who those people were? Well, at the time, the the ones that stick out the most were because they were just about to have their like ch- their big heyday was John Rich, wow, and Big Kenny, and they were like staples at Greg's house because they were, and so all the music mafia people, the Gretchens, James Otto, um, but beyond that, like Randy Hauser. I mean, Randy Hauser. I remember him sitting in living rooms playing stuff. Um, that's so crazy. A lot of people. When, when you were watching these people make music, still you're thinking maybe I could be a manager, or yeah. are you? I mean, well, because I like come this? from that like you have to it has to you have to earn it. 
blue collar, like you can't call yourself a songwriter because I eventually started just writing songs by myself, like in practice rooms at Belmont on the piano. And I had, I was proficient at piano, so I didn't have to co-write. You know, when I got that itch, I just started writing. Um, And I did for several years, but I was kind of closeted. Like it was really hard for me to even call myself a songwriter because I was looking around Nashville going, all these people have done this since they were five. How can I just write 10 songs and call myself a songwriter all of a sudden and I wasn't I was scared shitless to sing them why in front of, because I'd never really sung like I I wasn't like a look at me I can sing like I still I figured out 15 years later how to make it work as a songwriter but it's not it's not my home base at all is it is it, you just didn't like the spotlight on you in that way I wasn't confident and I didn't know what I was doing I mean I learned to sing like choral like whatever stuff that wasn't even in English like that's what we did in high school that's what we all do in high school and right. choir but I didn't know how to sing just to sing like a normal person one of the things that I I, I kind of figured out in the last year or two which is strange because I'm now you know in my 30s, mm-hmm. is that uh, I think when you're little and you sing at all, then everyone assumes that, oh, well, then you should you should sing in, in public or you should be the spotlight or mm-hmm. you should audition for this. But there's no concept of the fact that I sing more now than I ever have in my life. You know, I sing every day. So do you. Yeah. You know, I sing all over the place. But I, you, you can have a whole career where you sing in front of some of the best artists in the world, some of the best songwriters in the world, and you don't have to go up in front of, you know, 5, 10, 20, up to 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people mm-hmm. in order to enjoy being a singer for a living. Yeah. But you could, there are actual professions where you can be essentially alone at home if you want and sing into a microphone, and then it's part of, you know, you can sing background to stuff, or you mm-hmm. can... The fact that you can write songs and be a singer, it doesn't mean you have to actually have be in front of other humans. Yeah, like I get, I still get terribly nervous, even if I'm performing in front of a, a hundred people, two hundred people. I still get terribly nervous. Well, and it's such a part of the, the songwriting rite of passage or culture in Nashville to play writers' rounds, and that's a big part of, at least it appeared to be to me. As on that side of it in 2000, I moved here in 2002. So like early 2000s for me to go, if I'm even going to attempt to get a publishing deal, I need to be playing lots of writer's rounds so that people are aware of me. They see my name on flyers. They maybe somebody could, you know, walk in and hear a song of mine. And that was that that slowed me down. And think in accepting like that could be a reality for me because I was so scared to sing. But the guy I work for, Greg, he would, everyone would get so drunk and they'd be like, Nick, get that. He had just bought this baby grand at his house and this brand new piano. And I would, I don't, I guess I, I guess I've just always been like a figure it out kind of person. So I would just get up there and do it. And I remember, I remember sitting next to Jessica Andrews. I guarantee she doesn't remember this. I don't know if you know who that was, but she was, she was big about the same time that Leanne Rimes was blowing up in, Uh. in country music when I was like in middle school, high school, and we're like the same age. And I was obsessed with her. And I remember, um, She's a party, next her a sitting next to me on a piano bench, and we're all just sitting around. Someone across the room has a guitar, and Greg's like, Nicole, play that song you wrote, da-da-da. And I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. I mean, I, I mean, literally my heart race is right now. Becca Bramlett, I remember one, they're all coming back now. A Night with Jeffrey Steele and Becca Bramlett, like my songwriting, like they can sing... They can out-sing most of the people that have record deals, and I had I was getting up and singing in front of them, and it was just... Why did you so play? And it's interesting. I feel like in that environment, I start covering Weezer or doing <laughs> like, you know, or I start doing some something else. I'm doing, you know, Walking in Memphis or one of the two or three songs I actually know how to play. But mm-hmm. I, I was petrified to play my own songs just because I didn't want, I don't know, it was, that's vulnerable. I don't it's think I was good enough. Sing along. I don't think I was, yeah, I didn't love singing enough to learn other people's, uh, other songs. people's songs. I right. love writing. Right. Um, 
And Dude, what, when you start writing these songs that you're then performing in front of people mm-hmm. um, because your boss is telling you to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what are those first songs? Well, there was one called, <laughs> this is like the worst title ever. It was called Queen of the 88s. And it was a song about just being like, like I bite my nails, which I still do. Look at them, my God. And... um and my life is kind of a mess everywhere else. But when I sit down at a piano, it's like my domain. And it's like, this is my, I can be the queen of this. Like I can own this, which is so funny because I guess I was trying to like write, write myself into a superhero status because I was probably so intimidated at the time by what was happening to me and what was making, like what my heart was telling me to do. And um, the other song that it, uh, I played for a year like it was one of those like party staples was this song called right about now and it was probably the first song that I think everyone started to take me seriously like okay you could do this because it was just a song about uh, I wrote it on my 19th birthday or 20th it was the first birthday that I was away from my family I was here in Nashville and it was just like right about now the corn's about six feet high back home and right about now all this stuff is happening but I'm not there. And it was, it's still to this day is like one of my favorite songs. And it was probably in literally like the first six to eight songs I ever wrote. Did you ever try to get that cut later in your life? Yeah, actually, funny story. John Rich tried to do a single song publishing deal with me on that song. Um, And I knew when he did that, and John's like a great friend of mine. It was funny because he was like, come on, if you, you know, do this deal with me, I'll get this on cut. Like... And, you know, and this will help you so much. And I thought, if I can do, I need that song to get a publishing deal. If it's that good, I need it to, you know. And that song wasn't what got me a publishing deal. But, I, you know, it when he offered that to me, I thought, okay, I think I'm getting closer. So I'm going to hold out. How soon after school did you get a publishing deal? Right out a year. Wow. So I graduated in 2006 and um, still had that personal assistant job, which was perfect. At the, it was a perfect transition because I was working pretty much full time, but I could write. And I was just like working. And I was after I graduated, I started co-writing because um, I had time to because most of the time when I was writing, I was between school full time and working as an assistant. I was usually writing at like 11 p.m. by myself on a piano somewhere. Um, but once I got out of school, I had more time and I could like set up writing appointments and I started meeting with publishers. And it was interesting because in that period um, of time, a lot of people, and one of which was like Paul Worley, was at uh, parties like that. And they would hear me play songs and they would ask my boss or Greg, they would be like, is she, what's she doing? And he'd be like, no, she's going to graduate. And then you can talk to her, That's which he awesome. wasn't my agent or anything, but he was just being like dad kind of to me. And I'm so glad that he did because I'm the first one in my family on either side. Like I was like the first one generationally to graduate from college. And like, as far as I know. Did your whole family come out for graduation and stuff? Uh, Yeah, like a trillion of them. All seven children's children. <laughs> no, children. for sure. Like cousins, <laughs> like... Well, you get like, um, I think you get like four or six tickets a person, you know, for graduation. That and I was, work. <laughs> I was like hitting up, I was getting one ticket from this friend when I literally had 20, at least 20 people at my graduation. That's amazing though. And I live, my hometown's like 12 hours away. These people flew in, some of them, these people, my family, but like some of them, my cousins that were younger, that was their first time on an airplane. My grandpa, I mean, can't hear. I mean, it was like, the, it was like this whole it was this whole epic. It was like an indie movie. My graduation was like, getting everyone here. I mean, one of the things that's awesome is you, you get getting a publishing deal right out of college too. It's you know you're right away. You're a professional. Kind you know? of. Yeah. It's funny because I always kind thought. Of? Well, I feel like to me, I I had never felt like I still never felt like a songwriter until every every step of the way I'd be like but you're not really a songwriter yet. Like, I think I was like, when are they going to figure out that you're, you don't know what you're doing? Do you feel that way still? All the time. But I've, yeah, yeah, pretty much all the time. I had a meeting yesterday about a project that I got pulled in, like it just kind of happened organically, like to work on a record with, and I literally sat down with this manager and the first words out of my mouth is, I'm just telling you right now, I'm not qualified for this. (laughs) 
but I think it's going to be good. Like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I'm like, I'm not qualified, but that doesn't mean that we can't pull it off. What do you think it would take for you to feel that way? I don't know. I, my, I was raised with like, so like, don't feel entitled to anything that, um, yeah, but you're not entitled to it. You've kind of earned a little bit of that. No, I know. And also I have that, I have that hardcore, like, um, Christian element to my, um, which I am a Christian, but like, e- like even the way that I was raised, it's so ingrained. Like, you can't really earn things. Like, God does things, you know. Like for you, so like for me, I'm like I'm, I'm. I always have this, and I'm thankful that I have that I have this. Like that's part of my heart because whenever something amazing happens, it's not. Ne- I'm yes, I feel like I'm on a mountain, and I'm like ha, ah, you know, when a song goes number one or something. But I'm also like. Gosh, I know that I could have never orchestrated that. Gosh, I'm so humble. Like, I'm always so humbled by it. Yeah. And that's not like a, I'm not saying that just because it sounds good. I'm telling you, like, every time something happens, I'm just like, my hands are like, what? Yeah. How did that happen? You know? So you get this publishing deal um, and you're starting to write. How soon till you get cuts? Forever. I got a publishing deal in 2007. I didn't have like, a legitimate song that really made anybody money until 2012. Right. Or 2013. So somehow I managed to keep a publishing deal for six years without making anyone a penny. All at the same company. I've been at Warner Chapel since since that whole time. And every when I look back, it's like every year, like obviously they give you the first few years or like kind of just like as a courtesy, like we know it takes a couple years to get things going. After that, there was always like something that was almost like every year my option came up, there was like an almost like, oh, so and so is just cut this song. I think it could be it. Or, and then it wouldn't make it. And then it, yeah. Or, or I went through, which is another, probably a whole other podcast of getting to the point where I was getting no cuts and was like, maybe I just need to make a record because, As as an artist, as an artist, because I just want my song. I knew that I had so many songs and I was so, passionate I felt like I was like you know like the horse held behind the like the gate like I was like somebody let these songs out you know and so I I went through a couple years of okay well let's try this on let's see if this is how my songs are going to get out there is that how you end up on the voice it is how I end up on the voice so yeah. did you just do a blind audition or did somebody say, hey, so, you should? Uh, cr- the crazy story, and I'll keep it short, is that I worked with a manager for a few years to try to get my house, you know, my proverbial house in order, you know, for to get a record deal. And in that time, I got, she was, she got me a vocal coach and we, like, I learned to sing. Like, I know this was like 10 years after I moved to Nashville, but I finally learned how to use what I have. And we worked on a live show, like all this stuff that was not natural to me. And at the end of that two years, I thought we were about to pull the trigger. And like we had songs, we had bra- like we had all this whole thing, this whole here. Here's your artist. She sits me down and she's like, you're not an artist. You're going to be a successful writer, but I've just decided you're not an artist. Wow. I don't think it's going to happen. Was that hard happen. for you to hear? It was, but it was you also. you just started putting in all that, that work. Yeah, it was because I felt like to me, that was my plan B was like, I really just want my songs out there. So if plan B is maybe maybe I need to go be an artist so that my songs will get out there. So then I'm like, well, what's plan C? Do I go back to just trying to get cuts? I'm still not getting any cuts. Nobody cares. And um, so literally right after, but I look at that, I remember sitting in a parking lot going, okay. And I was like talking to God and I was like, okay, this means one of two things. This either means this is like, you're supposed to be done trying to be an artist, or it means that you figure out that you believe in what you're doing when no, when absolutely nobody else believes in it. And um, I literally got a phone call from two different people like within a week about trying out for The Voice. And I, I guess just because I was paying really close attention just to my circumstances at that time, I was like, I can't say no. And it was it wasn't like I was like... Um, I didn't do like the whole like stand in line for 20 hours. I mean, I had like an industry kind of like got, got to cut in line a little bit, but I did it just to know like that I, that wasn't supposed to do it. 
I was like, I'm going to go try out, get told no. And then I can move on a piece about that. And then actually that'll probably be the nail in the coffin. I'm done being an artist. If I can't make it on, you know what I mean? And I was also so, I also thought that the reason she told me I wasn't an artist was, was to motivate you. No, it was, it was the day after I played a show at the basement. And I think that she was like, she can't, she can't do a live show well enough to. Wow. And so I was like, well, no better, no better way to figure out if I can sing live and perform than to National go do. Television. This is like literally <laughs> the scariest shit ever for yeah. me. I would still like we t- already talked about. I am not comfortable singing live, and I'm more comfortable now. But it's such an extreme, dude. I know. I'm. I mean, literally, you go from I don't know if I want to play this song at a small party to let's let's go on national television and sing and hope that they turn a chair. Well, I'm. I'm braver than I am scared. More than I am scared. Oh, interesting. I'm really scared. Yeah. Like even now, like of a lot of things. Like I'm producing a new thing, and I'm like super scared of it. But I guess I'm just more brave yeah. than I am scared. Doesn't mean I'm not like so scared. Yeah. I just do it anyway. One of the things that's interesting about the voice is just that the only people who've had any success at all have been country women. You know, there mm-hmm. no other genre has ever really been successful. You know, Jordan Smith has some had some success doing his Christmas album and whatnot, <clears throat> but in you know fourteen seasons or something like that, it, you know, as they say, it's the show where the judges win. Mm-hmm. And yet, the only thing that that uh, the only people who've had any success and at that time were country women. So, yeah. I mean, you obviously were in tune with, you know. This is a, a smart opportunity. Do, do you think that that helped you at all in your writing? It did. Well, I think what it did, did it, first of all, it was the first time that I had taken any time off from writing. It, I was gone for off and on for about three months. I wasn't on the show that long. I didn't make it past the battle rounds. But the you go out for one of the legs, I was out there for three and a half weeks. And then I came back and then I was out there again for another three weeks. Um, what you, year was that? 2011 we filmed it and so I think it was the first time I had just taken a breather and stepped away from writing um so there was that element there was also that this like I I think I came back really confident because I surprised myself I never thought I was gonna make it I I keep I kept getting like further and further along and like oh yeah now you're singing for a producer now you're singing for Carson now you're singing for oh crap now you're doing this on TV even then I was like this I didn't even think about making it I just thought about how do I not cry when they don't turn around do not cry on TV. That's how you get on TV. And then you're on the Today Show the next morning. And then like that cannot be the biggest thing that ever happens to you in your life. And oh, it's so, making my hands sweat. So I, I can't handle it. I know. <laughs> so that um I came back really just like, wow, if I can do that, I can do anything. And yeah, I also sure. met Raylan actually before the voice. i I like told her is there that's a whole other episode. Like I told her to try out and through that, um, we were writing, and Miranda heard a bunch of the stuff that I was writing with Raylan because Miranda and Blake were very invested in Ray, and they knew that Ray was a pretty new writer. Like, hadn't she was sixteen and hadn't really written, and so they were like, "Oh, these songs, like, where are these coming from?" And so that's how I got on Miranda's radar. And so, yeah, you take out the vo- the voice is my butterfly effect. Wow. Yeah. Did you have a personal life while this was going on? Oh yeah. So. I got married to Rodney in 2007, so we had been married for Rodney almost... Claussen, Rodney Clausen, another a songwriter, very successful in his own right. Yeah, he's living in my shadow. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. So you meet um, him when? We we got married in 2007, so we had been married for almost five years when I did The Voice. Oh, I didn't realize you were... Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, oh. he, and he had... He was like um, hitting a stride as a writer. Like, I it was... I mean, while I was just like piddling along, trying to like just trying to get a crumb, he was like he had the whole pie, you know, and it was magical for him. And um, actually, while I was out at the show, I remember him calling me saying, have the next Blake Shelton single. And it was uh, drink on it had just been a single. And he just found out that Sure Be Cool If You Did was about to be a single and it was about to come out. Like, and it was all timed up to come out like right around the time that the show that I was filming or a part of was like 
going to debut and all that stuff. And, um, and I just remember being so, I was very deliberate. No one there knew I was married to him. Like they knew I was married, but I just was so deliberate about never mentioning. Like I would just work my way around it in interviews. How long did it take till Blake figured it out? I don't know if he ever did. I think, I think I was already off, technically off the show because after the, sometime in that, like I said, I got kicked off the battle rounds. And then after, and you, you film the blind audition and the battle rounds are like, like you, you film that ahead of time. Yeah. And then everyone goes home. And then if you have made it, then you go back and film lives. Well, in that lag time after all of the pre taping of battle rounds, Ray was like re- getting really close to Blake and she told him, she's like, just right. so you know that Nicole girl is married to, yeah. you know, that I'm writing these songs with his yeah. married. And he's like, no shit, you know? <laughs> um, and so. Did you know all these? Because, you know, with. You're going around doing all these co writes. Your husband's very successful at that time. You hadn't gotten the cuts yet, but you had to know a lot of these stars and whatnot just from being at number one parties and mm-hmm. being at, you know, BMI awards and, and whatnot. I mean, that's that's an interesting scenario when you're all of a sudden on television, those people seeing you mm-hmm. is are they seeing you as competition or is they or is it just so exciting for in Nashville to be on television nationally? I mean, I, how does that change your I didn't know. It was a risk. It was a risk to go like what is how is this gonna brand me in people's minds? Um, because ultimately I just wanted to write songs and have them out, you know, and, and I've always just, and I think respect, I just want to be respected as a songwriter. And so that was a risk. I think it surprised a lot of people. And I think they're like, I think it was like, whoa, I didn't think that she would ever do that. Um, so I, they never, I, it, it only did good for me. I don't know how, because it's a reality show about singing and I don't want to be a singer. So Miranda, <laughs> I don't know why that all worked. Miranda finds out about you. Mm-hmm. She's into these songs. Are you writing directly with her? I only wrote with her. So come back from the voice. Still, nothing's happening. And I think you know what I'm done. Be- like I knew that was like the nail in the coffin of I'm not doing the artist thing anymore. And I told Rod- like Rodney and I were like, let's have a baby. So we got pregnant. And I remember thinking, again, I'm talking to God. I talk to God a lot. And I was like, I don't know what my heart's going to tell me to do when I hold a baby, like I hold my child for the first time. And if that means that I'm not a writer anymore, then I'm willing to let that go. And um, I had gotten a few cuts while I was pregnant, which I like to attribute to baby karma. Um, What were the cuts? We Were Us was one of them. Never but, heard of it. But Still. but it had not come out. Like we had just, <laughs> right. we heard that he had cut it and we heard that he had like three or four different people that were in the running to maybe sing the duet with him and none of them were tied down. So I'm like, are we going to lose this song? I, like there was, an, and we're not, I'm not close to that camp and I think they kept it pretty quiet. So I still was like, I got a cut, but I don't know what's going to happen with it. Um and again, I hadn't held my baby. So I have this baby. And then like a month later, I get pulled in to write with Miranda for the first time. And that day, we wrote Automatic and we wrote Platinum. Like in four hours. We wrote, that was like our- You wrote both of them in four hours? We wrote both of them in one day, four oh, hours. Come on. That's and, not real. That's real. And I remember before I left, I, I was like, she was talking about recording- her part on We Were Us. And I was like, oh, it happened? Like you sang on it? I didn't know. Like I yeah. I didn't I had heard several names were thrown out there and she's like, oh yeah. She's like, we worked we worked our asses off on it. Like it like getting like all these parts on the and outro. You come and- home probably like a zombie being like, maybe wrote the song of the year. And no, that Miranda not- maybe maybe just featured on the other song of the year. Well it's funny because <laughs> she like, goes hi, hi Rodney. <laughs> like, <laughs> well yeah I was you know I just if what I a crazy a, day. Yeah, if I it is now looking back. If it if I was in a daze, it was just because I had a newborn baby, honestly. Right. I don't think that I could I was just kinda like get through it, you know. Um she had said, Whatever happened with that song? We like we worked our asses off it. I mean I haven't heard a mix or anything. Like, what's going on with it? She's like, I'm gonna text Keith. 
And I think me ri- me writing with her that day, she reached out and was like, I want a mix of that song. And so, so I... So crazy. I know. It was... That was like a one of those perfect storm days. When you came out here when you were 12 or 13 for Fanfare, and then Keith Urban cuts your song, and you have Miranda Lambert featured on it, is that... Um, I mean, how... Speaking of serendipity, I mean, that must have felt just mm-hmm. like... A, a glitch in the system or something. Well, know? I. it's funny because when I heard that I was getting to write with Miranda, I literally just started praying to get a Miranda cut. Actually, I probably started praying for it before because I got to meet her and Ray kind of brought me into her world a little bit. And she's like, she Miranda had said, we should write sometime, we should write. And so I felt like it was enough of a possibility to hope to get a cut. Um. So then like, yeah, it, so then when she ends up on that song and then I ended up getting five cuts on that record, it was like, well, what is, I was not ready. I, I was like, well, I just wanted a cut. I just wanted a cut from anyone. So like two like superstars was a so little crazy. bit, too, it was, a, and it was, it's funny because like we all have that rite of passage, like first single that doesn't work. And I had that, um, I had a Josh Kelly single when he was trying to be a country artist back in the day and that one didn't work and but this one came out and it was like, oh yeah, that's gonna work, you know. And so that was like really fun to to not be nervous the whole time. Like I felt like I could just enjoy it because I know this song's gonna go. Um, yeah. It during was, um, during your pregnancy, that's actually when we met, probably. And yeah, which pregnancy? I think the first one. Yeah, probably so. And uh, you're in in the we were just talking to. A, a woman in the pop writing community who is saying how getting pregnant is is scary mm. because in the pop world there's like a there's sort of a difficult before and after for somebody who's pregnant and you were literally cutting vocals while you were pregnant when I first met you it was, it was actually one that. of the first times I had ever been in a studio in Nashville with a song that's being actually demoed and not just something that was written at a writing camp. That's right, with a band. That was like yeah. your first demo session, right? Yeah. I remember that. Well, I forgot it until you started talking about it. Now I remember. But it's, it was just interesting for me to see, you know, I remember you say that it's like, it was, guys, it's really hard to breathe. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, you don't see that every day in the pop world. No, you don't. But here they seem to be really supportive mm-hmm. of women having their, you know, living their life, having their families and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever feel any pushback or anything? Or were you nervous about... Well, I mean, obviously I was nervous. Said- I was very nervous. In fact, when I got... I, I had committed to take like three months off after I had that baby. And that baby, that, that said child, <laughs> Charlie, little Charlie girl. Alleged child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's when I got the call to write with Miranda. And I was like, I don't know if I can still write songs. Like, I felt like... It's like there's life before you're a mom and life after you're a mom. And I felt like I had been to the moon and back, like birthing a baby and having a newborn. And I was like, I don't know if I can, like, I know how to. That is so tattooed on my identity now. I don't know if I can go back and be like a songwriter and like go in a room and be creative. And so I actually booked a write uh, to write with David Hodges like a few days before the Miranda write just to kind of like shake off the cobwebs. And I'd only been gone like a month, but I was very, um, I was very nervous about what that would look like. Um, because when I, like my, my, when I came to Nashville and I was like obsessed with songwriters, the only real f- female that was really doing great was Hillary, Hillary Lindsay. And she's my hero, my, you know, and um, like if there's anyone's career that I could emulate, it would be hers. Um, but at the time, I was going, the only female that's really having success isn't married and doesn't have kids. And so no one ever said you shouldn't be, shouldn't have a family. But it was kind of like, well, does that mean that, that you shouldn't have that a you, family? That you can't? Like, uh-huh. I don't know. And um, and a lot has had cha- has changed. Um Years later, when I actually was in the game, you know, Jesse Alexander came along into my life, and she had she was a mom, and Natalie Hemby 
um, who's a great friend of mine, you know, she had, she became a mom and I was looking at them and I thought, okay, they were like the junior seniors. I was freshman, sophomore. And I think that really planted a seed of hope in me that I could do both. And I mean, it's a lot more work and, you know, my husband and I have the same job, you know, but it's funny cause we, we wrote the other day. We we're just Together? now right. Yeah. We're just now writing for the first time. What is that like? Do you guys just wake up and say, "All right, shall we start?" Or do you no like, because you lean over to each other and no, no. I imagine that that like you whole... wake up and your eyes are closed and there's a piano to your side of the bed <laughs> and he closes his eyes and he grabs a guitar. You guys aren't even really awake. You just start playing in no, bed. No, here's the reality. We wake <laughs> up. There's a monitor three feet from our head with a bit two babies screaming, banging on their door, trying to get out. Somebody has a poopy diaper. Like you just jump out of bed and you start you know, making scrambling eggs and you do this whole thing and then you both like, you know, juggle the schedule so that one can go work out and the other one can go to the chiropractor or doctor appointment and then you see each other at 11. Like, it's a totally different person. That's what it feels like. It feels like I saw you a little bit this morning, but now we're like different people when is we show up. Is it hard to say... You know, no, that's not a good idea. Or is it easier? Oh, to he say has that? no trouble telling me, you know, that's not a good idea. In fact, last week we wrote and he was not in a good mood. Um, because I he had like he has an injury, his back injury right now, and he I was throwing out all these ideas and he was like he's like, Seriously? That's what you really and I'm like I mean I mean that's I, I have a very thick skin and I have to be to be married to him because he's he's not like He's not the most complimentary. That's not his gifting. Right. He's being complimentary. <laughs> he has he is the most solid person and consistent person that I know in the world and that's why he's my person. But if you're looking for someone to just blow smoke up your ass, not the guy. Not go <laughs> elsewhere. It's funny. I can imagine that afterwards you come home and he's like, "Hey, how was work?" You're like, well, "You're yeah. a dick." <laughs> well, you know what's funny is we were in the kitchen. We both left that right, and he had to go do a finish right, and I went somewhere else or to the studio, and we met back home. And I was like, "In next time I saw him was I was making dinner." And he came up to me in the kitchen. He's like, I'm sorry if I was mean to you today in the right. And I was like, you weren't mean to me. I was like, you're just blunt. Yeah. You know? Well, this brings up to the next segment, which is what would Luke Laird ask you? And and this is Luke Laird's question for you. (laughs) Um, Have you ever considered highlighting Rodney more in your Instagram stories? (laughs) So he can have more sponsorship opportunities <laughs> during his bass fishing tournaments. The funny thing about Rodney is that he acts like he doesn't care about the Insta. But he reveals through conversation, like when he knows that someone wore the hot pink t-shirt last Tuesday to the Rolling Stones concert, like that he's following everything. And he knows, I mean, he gets it all. In fact, the other day he was like, you know what? I've really been noticing in your Insta stories that you're like getting more like, he's like, I actually think you compared to this other girl that's actually a blogger, you actually have more depth to your, and I'm like, wow, you are really following this. His Instagram is like a parody. It, if you are looking, if you're a songwriter, you know, if you're a songwriting buff and you like to follow songwriters and you go type in Rodney Clawson, guarantee you get to his Instagram and you're like, that's not the real him. It literally looks like, like, a parody of him it's of, a of what a country writer would live of him. it's ins- i mean it's the it's like so and maybe it's like a um knee jerk response to my insta style which you is, have a ton of followers i do why i don't know i mean i have you're ideas very good, you're very good at social media i have i mean it's funny because well i know i think i'm good at it i mean some my strengths like just happen to line up with social media. I mean, it, it, if you think about it, a high school yearbook is yeah. the paper is the beta version of, of, I mean, and even now Natalie Hemby is like, you're like the yearbook editor of Music Row. And I mean, to take a picture, an action shot, to edit it, crop it, make sure that it's right, put a, you know, get in Photoshop, make sure that all the, the finish on the, you know, the picture's right, and then write a caption, I did that all through high school and right. for the, our, our hometown newspaper. 
in 2011, no, 2010, I did, I had, again, I had zero going on. So I had all the time in the world. I did this blog. Do you remember those flip cams? Yeah. So I did a thing called the flip project for no reason. Um, where I took a video a day for 365 days and I posted it on, I think it was like a, um, like a blog spot account and I would write something about it. I would edit the video. I would put a bit of music to it. And some of them were like 15 seconds long. Some of them were like full, like three minute montage, whatever. And then I would write like some kind of piece with it. And, um, and I'd, just did it because I like to do it. I loved editing. I loved putting it together, trying to make something out of nothing every day. Um, I mean, you really are going to need to write a book. <laughs> no, I For know. Real, because I, I mean, it's not. It's there are people. Um, there are people I know who want to write a book about their their career or their life, but they they can't really get to a session on time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're yeah. not on their own time saying, "Ah, in my spare time, I'm going to do mm-hmm. 365." But Post. is that not like Insta story? But is that not Instagram before no, Instagram? Yeah, that was exactly. like seven years be- ago, yeah. and I was basically Instagram. It was a video or a picture with, with stuff. But I, yeah, I have you read that book, uh, the subtle art of not giving a. Yeah. <laughs> There's a thing in that book that I just finished that book, and it talks about um, streamlining how you define your goals. Yeah. And it's really cool because it's like, um, and it really spoke to me because I'm a songwriter, but I've always felt like, I don't feel like that fully is my identity. But whereas some people are like, I've been writing songs since I was six years old. This is all I know and it's all I ever want to know. I've never felt that way. And um, because I'm always like, maybe I'm going to do other things or if this went away, I would be happy doing other things. And in the book, it's like, instead of your goal being, Instead of identifying your goal as like being songwriter of the year, simplify it, make it, but make it bigger. Like I'm a creator. That's my, that is my goal is to just create. And I I think that's more of how I like think of myself. I just like to make stuff Sure. and I like to do it with words and stories. And so I'll probably do something beyond songs at some point. When you have these songs that are, let's go back real quick to automatic, you know, it's, it's winning an ACM and you're at home and mm. they're they're congratulating you on stage because you're pregnant for the second time. Mm-hmm. So the song goes from after the you have your first child, you go, you write automatic in a day, along with platinum, sorry, two two <laughs> big records in a day. You end up getting pregnant, and by the time Automatic's done with its run and it gets all the accolades it gets, a massive number one song for a female artist, which is huge, you know, and she's winning, you know, gets a Grammy nomination, gets all the kinds of things. ACMs come on, and you're at home. Mm-hmm. But they thank you, mm-hmm. and they, they, which is amazing. Yeah. You know? At that point, were you thinking, okay, now I can retire? Or are you thinking yeah. at that point, no, now I need to go, and as soon as I'm done with you know, number two, let's go out and, and start writing again? I was thinking a lot of things. I mean, one of them was, oh my gosh, I, was, I almost forgot the show was on tonight because we got home from the hospital like 24 hours ago, and you're in survival mode at that point. You don't even know what time it is. You're taking it hour by hour. Um so I wasn't, I was there in my head, but then I, once it happened, I remember I was jumping up and down screaming with a newborn in my arms. And then about 30 minutes later, it just got quiet. Like, like I could just, you could just feel, cause it was just me and Rodney and our kids and, you know, in the house, it wasn't like we were having a party or an ACM party and it was quiet. And I just like, tears just started coming down my face. And I think that they were happy, sad. I think it was like gratitude but it was also and and shock but it was also is that going to be the biggest thing that ever happened to me and I didn't get to be there for it and then also holy shit look at my life I'm holding this miracle that's so much more important than an ACM it was literally like I felt like God was playing a trick on me like really like that's what that's a dream this is a dream whoa like check your values right now because I felt I was being real and that I was sad that I wasn't there. 
But then I felt guilty for feeling sad that I was not there, you know, because I was, I mean, and this is probably a woman thing, but when you're pregnant, all you do is just pray for a healthy baby. I, like I would trade anything, you know, I'd give up songwriting. I would give up everything just to have, for my child to be safe and healthy. And then God gives you this healthy baby. And then he's like, ha ha, look, you that know, was, and that then, was your trade off was that you missed. I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. Wow, you need to really check yourself. I mean, I had but How many people get a shout out at the ACMs? I know, but I, you know, it was like the 50th. I think for like a year, I couldn't I was like, "Oh my gosh, it was the most beautiful moment," but the further I get away from it, I think I look back and I realize how more of the bitter of the bittersweet is actually in me because I see that's a mountain and you don't realize how hard it is to get to have a single, a cut, a single, a number one, a song that's nominated, a song that wins. All that is like astronomical odds. And the further that you get away from that, you look back and you go, gosh, will that ever happen to me again? And then you're like, damn, I wasn't there. Will I ever know what it's like to be sitting in the audience at that, you know? And that was like the year, it was the 50th anniversary. So they had it at Texas Stadium it was like 120,000 people or something. It was like they set a Guinness World Record for an award show. So to get to go on stage, like it was like the pinnacle of any songwriter's moment. You know, we don't get those moments very often, yeah. you know, especially for y'all. Like we have number one parties in Nashville, but for you guys that, you know, have a lot of pop cuts, they don't hang a banner. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, in downtown I- LA for you guys generally. So that, you know, I mean, that's like, we had a moment this year where my my wife's been been sick a lot in the last few years. She's getting better, luckily, um, happily. But there was a moment where we, we unfortunately weren't able to go to the Grammys this year, you mm-hmm. know. And that was like, and actually, I mean, I, she she was like, "You need to go." So I went with my co writer, which is great. But it was a, a really interesting moment because it's that same thing of like, I don't know, I. I care about awards more on on paper than I do in the moment mm. versus I'd I'd much rather, you know, much rather have a, a a healthy family no matter what. Right. You know, I mean I do love I do love the experience. I'm like an experience junkie. Like I love I'm not like a big traveler or anything, but I just live for a moment. Like I will spend all morning setting up an environment in our house so that our kid like I'll get paints out and a drop cloth and get boxes and like get everyone in their swimsuits and like cut up watermelon like and it's not staging something for Instagram it's like I want to create a moment and get prepared and like so that everyone can just be here and be and have a moment and I think that's what it is about the Grammy ACM conversation was like that was a moment can I ever would that ever be recreated for me again on in my time on earth you know what about all the times you win BMI awards it's not, I don't think that's the same. It's I, funny because, you know, this year it'll be the first time that, that the Grammys have songwriters as part of Album of the Year. Mm. And, um, you know, before that, like, what you get, there's, for a pop writer, we don't have a subcategory. Humble and Kind can be nominated both for Country Song and for Song of the Year. Yeah. we, Which is kind of... Um, uh, it's a little demeaning to country music and and urban music that that it's saying like normally your songs aren't good enough to be part of this category. I hate that about mm-hmm. about that award. Really, the pop there should be a pop genre also, and then you can do song of the year, where maybe you have all of the winners of all these things. Mm-hmm. But the gist of it is that it's really hard for uh, a pop writer to win a song of the year. Or to to get a nomination, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's there's a lot of reasons why they they win, they don't, whatever it is. But the BMIs is not subjective. It's actually or ASCAP, you know, mm-hmm. they're not. There, it's really the fifty most played songs. It's not really arguable. It's just mm-hmm. the ones that are most performed. So yeah. when you win that, to me, that means more than most of the awards. It's not mm-hmm. somebody voting on it. There are no labels involved. There's no PR campaign. It 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 doesn't matter. So you and, show up. You show up and you win a BMI award, and it's because your song won. 
You know, you win even the NSAI award that you won. Like those things are, they've they're a diff- It's a different vibe. Mm-hmm. It's like a. It's different when it comes from. Well, and that stuff can be a popularity contest. Right. And this, you know, right. this is a small town. This is like music grows like a high school campus to me. You know, you got your this guy, you got your. Everyone kind of has their lane. I mean, yeah. And it can be cool kids table at those things when we vote for each other. It can also, I mean, when the right song wins, if Humble and Kind wins Song of the Year, everyone's like, yeah, duh. Right. You know, nobody's thinking, oh, that's because it's a cool kid. Right, right, exactly. But I do. I Rodney's never won, and Rodney jokes like he can only win any, he's never won anything voted by peers ever. Like he's never won a writer of the year, even years that he, all the numbers were there. You know, right? Um, he's only won like a BMI, like you said, writer that's completely by numbers. Whereas I think I'm a little bit of the opposite, where I think I could have, if I could string two hits together in a row, I'd probably be writer of the year. I don't know why. It's just like a different you, perception like, of people. Do you kind of have four singles right now? I do. You have, it's like it's just all the dominoes just fell at the yeah. right time. Kenny Chesney's All the Pretty Girls, Lee Bryce's Boy, Florida Georgia Lines, Smoothin, and Ray Lynn's Lonely Call. Mm-hmm. Um, is this is this the moment that you is it, when you said you could if you could string two in a row? Do you feel like this <laughs> well, is your? I'm not this saying I'm going to be writer of the year. I just think people think that I have had a lot more success than I've had on paper. Um, people. And maybe maybe I just still think of myself as bottom of the ladder. I kind of think that might be it. I don't because it's it's really hard to have a single, one single, uh, yeah. a single. Also, my relativities are jacked because you know of who I'm married to. I mean, Rodney's had like 25 number ones. Right. So I've had two right. so far. I've had other singles, but two number ones. So whether I like it or not, and I'm not comparing myself to him, but I just know that there are so many other levels of mass success beyond what I've had that even though I'm completely content where I'm at, I don't think of myself on the Ashley Gorley, Shane McAnally, Rodney Clausen, Luke Laird, Josh Osborne, there are others level because they have the numbers, but they are my peers and I write with them every day. And um, Do you feel competition at, at home or no? I don't. Yeah. I will say it's going to be it's going to be like trying on new clothes like this summer, like as I have more because, you know, I, for Rodney, you know, Rodney, it all ebbs and flows, you know, and Rodney doesn't have a ton on the radio right now and I'm about to have more, which is never. Yeah. I'm not allowed is, to name some of them. Well, I was told by your publisher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll cross it. We'll, we'll you know cross do you like bridge when, when this pu- when this airs you can put like a since we went to print or since oh, we yeah. went since we <laughs> it, it'll be hopefully there. we'll see well, that, that leads us to the next thing which is, i'm gonna I'm list five people and you just say what comes off the top of your head oh gosh let's go with ray lynn unicorn unicorn <laughs> i love that okay is it like a one word or yeah is it sure like a no whole comp- let's run with that i like that she's unicorns and um the first thing I think is when she used to stay with us, she would take out her weave and she would let it, she would wash it and she would lay, lay it out all over like the drying racks and the the counters in our bathroom. And I was just like, I mean, you'd walk in there, it looked like somebody like massacred her head. <laughs> exactly. It scared <laughs> shit out of me every morning. I'm like waking up and I'm like having to move them off the toilet lid, you know, so I can go to the bathroom. This is so funny. Yeah. It's so weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's go with Kenny Chesney. Fanfare 1997 stood in line to meet him for a long time and I wore the worst outfit ever. Otherwise, I would have already posted it on Instagram. Does he know um, you should absolutely post this on Instagram. I was wearing like a. You like, owe this to us for doing this interview. You was, need to post okay, this. Let picture. me try to describe to you what was going on with my fashion Great. or lack of at the time. Okay. I'm wearing like a hat, that like a boat, like um, a guy in grumpy old men would wear to fish, like one of those low hats with like glasses that were square with blue lenses and my hair in braids with a Nike shirt. It was like, is like, I just like got 
one thing from every store at a strip mall and just put them all together. Sick. It's horrible. Just wait. If this song goes and whatever the song does at some point, I'm sure I will insta celebrate yeah. with that picture. You should. Well, the it captions obviously uh, all the all the pretty girls. <laughs> Yeah. This is what all the pretty girls look like. Yeah, all the pretty girls said. shop at Hot Topic <laughs> right. in Hot Wichita, Topic. Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Florida Georgia Line. Mm. Vanilla wafers, because when we were riding smooth, I remember we went through a period where there were things being smoked. I don't smoke, but there were things being smoked, and people were just kind of in their own fun place. And there was a minute when vanilla, there was a line about vanilla wafers. This is so funny. That was in contention for the song. It didn't make the final cut, right. which I think is a good thing. Yeah. But that's what I will I'll always think vanilla wafers. So funny. Miranda Lambert. Oh, you goodness. can you can throw in Natalie Hemby in this if you'd like. Mm. Man, I have so many things. Uh first thing I think I guess I think platinum. Yeah. Um because I remember the day that we wrote Platinum, I was like, you should call your record Platinum. And I don't know why. And she did it. And I still don't know why I care that I got to be a little part of that decision in any way. But It's a huge thing. But just to see it in print like 20 years later, like even on whatever the Wikipedia is in 20 years or whatever, or they put her in the Hall of Fame to be like, Platinum, I was part of that. I'll always, yeah. And you'll go to, uh, you know, when you're at a concert, the concert's called it, the, the T-shirts say it, and there's, it's, a ma- it's magical for sure. Yeah. Let's go with Natalie Hemby. Mm. She is probably, I would, I probably, the word example comes to mind because she has been such a good example for how to handle yourself in this business for me, um, in terms of loyalty, in terms of how to not change and how to treat people. Like I, I looked up to her so much that I rem- I know that I've taken things like watching her not cancel a new artist to write with someone big or how she'll make the time to go to someone's show because they're her friend, not because they are the most popular person. And I just always was like that is significant and that's how I want to be if I ever get to go you know get to where you are and I just hope that I can be that for somebody else because I do think that everyone's looking up to someone else at every level and when you get somebody at the top I think of her at the top of female writers in our business all the good values of that person trickle down or the bad values because that's who we learn from and for me she's example um, I know I, we did just did five, but I'm gonna do two more. One is your your you could answer as Warner Chapel, or you can answer as B J Hill, but <gasps> your publishers really bad bank. I mean, I don't know, I don't know who was making the decisions all these years to keep investing in me, but they clearly did not know how to do math. I mean. They, I, I, I still or don't know. Or they're geniuses. Or they're geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, <laughs> really bad bank, or they're the greatest bank. You know, yeah, that's a good investment after all. Yeah, I've been there you ten know? years this year. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, this is like a big year for me because yeah. it's ten years at Warner Chapel, ten years of marriage. Um, yeah. it's my Jesus year. I'm turning thirty three next month. Yeah. So I'm. Um, 33 is really intense because you realize that's, you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. It's like Mm -hmm. Jesus was 33. (laughs) Obviously, like, you know, I'm past that and I haven't really done either of that. So uh, I think, (laughs) well, you've done a lot. I'm sure if you like put on paper everything that 33 was for you, it was probably significant. Yeah, it was all right. Um, Okay. So uh, (laughs) last one Rodney Clausen. Farmer. I still think of him as a farmer, and I like I, I think because he still operates like one. He just does it with songs yeah. and with life. I mean he he does he's the most he's the most steady person I've ever been around. Most consistent, which is hard. Like is not typical in our business. There's so many ups and downs, and so many people that are emotionally driven in a creative world. And he's just like. Put your head down, plant another seed. Put your head down, go to work and do it. And I've seen him. 
I've seen what it looks like for him to get a phone call that he's not they're pull they're changing the single the last minute in the car when we really needed the money like 10 years ago and I've seen him win rider of the year and he's the same exact person in every sing in both situations almost to a fault on the rider of the year day cuz I remember sitting in a limo out in front of the BMI going okay you are not too cool to get excited this is probably not going to happen many times, if ever again. So you need to lose your cool card and get excited because I should not be more excited about this than you are. Right. I was like momming him. I was like, you get your ass in gear and get excited and be thankful. He's like, yeah, but you know, I mean, I guess, you know. Yeah, but also, I mean, that what's, what's kind of incredible is that you can both be a writer when you need to be, a mom when you need to be, a wife when you need to be. And those are all separate separate jobs. And mm-hmm. I, I struggle sometimes, think I'm a good husband. You know, I mm-hmm. work really hard at trying to be a good husband. I'm a good business guy, but like it's really hard to multitask on anything. And if I didn't have the I mean, same thing where it's like it, to have someone in your life that supports you unconditionally is really an incredible thing to find Mm -hmm. and I'm so fortunate I know Rodney is and vice versa I'm sure you know there's a reason why you guys have lasted for 10 years Mm -hmm. and while you have a you know two kids and everything you've got four singles out at the same time if that was all you did in your career Mm -hmm. then that's that's a plenty sufficient you know discography for a a wikipedia and that's just right now Mm -hmm. and and yet you still are you know able to say you know make sure you're excited Mm -hmm. you know that's really hard to do i think i think that's what i think that comes across in your instagram Mm -hmm. i think that's why I'm sure I'm not the only person who follows you on Instagram that really enjoys when you post stuff because it is, um, it you do show this ability to be familial, funny, and successful. And as a as uh, you know, a fan of women and feminism, it's exciting to see, you know, somebody who's a successful career woman who's also a successful mom and wife. Oh, thank you so much. That may, I mean, of anything that you ever could have talked, I mean, it's funny because I can talk about songwriting for a long time, but I could, I could, nothing brings me more joy than to just sit and talk about like how our house works because that's the, probably the thing I'm the most proud of is like our house is like Grand Central Station. You know, that's how I feel. It's like, okay, I mean, I know what it feels like to walk in, to be dressed up and get our hair and makeup done and walk into like an award show with Rodney and watch him win awards or we both get to win awards. But there, but I also know what it feels like to literally like crash at like 10 p.m. at night in bed and like be like, okay, the kitchen's clean. Everybody did this. We got the kids to three birthday parties. You had, we, you know, we FaceTimed with your mom because it was like, we did life good today like to me I know like that's like the thing that I'm the most proud of because this is all going away I mean at some point I mean even if it's here until even if I get to do music or we get to till the day we die I, I just feel like the legacy will live on in our kids so much longer that they'll pass on to their kids whatever whatever moves we make we're the butterfly effect of like our lineage yeah. So much more than on our songs. I mean, it's funny because someone was talking the other day about songwriter and they were like, oh yeah, but they haven't had a hit in like five years. I'm like, yeah. So that's like a really cool thing. Like five years ago, they had a hit. They're not over, but that's how fickle yeah. it is. I mean, gosh, even two years. Rodney was talking about somebody's like, yeah, they haven't had a hit in two years. I'm like, oh, they're lucky they got to have a hit two years ago because, right. you know, but... Yeah, my mantra in the last couple of years is legacy is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody will remember. You know, no, it's kids true. don't know who Paul McCartney is. They just certainly don't know. You know who who I am or any of the songs. You know, it's just not how that really works. It's, oh, for sure. So you better I don't, en- I don't enjoy even know who job. the pop writers are, and this is my yeah. job. Yeah. I am fully immersed in the song publishing world, the little microcosm of you know, or like, and I don't know who yeah. these names are of people that are dominating pop 
Yeah. So it's but now you do because of this podcast. Yes, I wish. <laughs> when are you going to do one of these? Because we need to talk about you. We need to hear you guys talk. Yeah. Is that going to be? Are you holding out for a, a like a motion picture? I don't to know. Do yours? I mean, it's not really. You know, I, I'm I'm trying to make it less and less about me as we go through the episodes because I don't. find you I find you guys so fascinating. I mean, this is what I, the reason why I do writing is because I can have a day with you every time I'm in Nashville and that's really fun. Mm-hmm. I can write with these incredible writers and just catch up and find out what they're doing in their life and then try to write the best song that they have mm-hmm. right now today and then I can go tomorrow and Try to find out what that writer has been doing and what that mm-hmm. artist has been doing. Try to write their best song for the day because that's what's fun about this job. It And it's weird because I think I, I talk too much a lot in my life. And this has been a really enlightening process of listening to myself communicate with humans. Mm. And it's changing how I, I have normal conversations. And it's changing how I mm. write. And it's changing how I think maybe... Other people are writing, and maybe it's even changing aspiring writers, how they should write and how they should communicate. That it's not just about whatever awards I win. That's pretty cool, but it only works if all my co-writers are amazing. Mm -hmm. It only works if all the artists put in the effort of going and doing shows and radio and all the things they have to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how awesome it is. If I come up with the idea and I have the the work tape, that's awesome. That's cool to show the five people who care. (laughs) Yeah. You know? Uh But in reality, the kid who's, you know, dancing around to whatever song I did, it's not because I wrote it. It's cool that I feel connected to it. Mm -hmm. But it's no longer mine once it's that kid's dancing to it. You don't get that feeling when you, like, see someone sing your song, like, in an arena? Oh, it's it's but, the coolest thing in but the world. I'm probably narcissistic because I make it about me. I'm sitting there <laughs> going, looking around, and I go, like, I zoom out, and I go back, or I zoom in, I guess, back to, like, the moment of creation or the moment that someone, that the song started to take shape or some who said what in the room. Like, I go back to that when but I'm looking so, around going, whoa, that set all this in motion. The last time I was in, in Nashville, I was on tour with Selena Gomez, and she played three songs of mine in the last tour. And so every arena we went to is 20,000 people singing three of the songs that we had done. And some of them were with my friends. One of them was a song I wrote, you know, 100% of the lyrics and melodies, you know, Mm -hmm. and my voice is in the track. So you hear my voice, you hear everyone singing along. And I guarantee if I went up to what, some random 12-year-old girl and be like, hey, I wrote those songs. One, that's creepy. Two, (laughs) Two, I think they'd be like, Okay, can you stop interrupting me while I'm watching Selena Gomez? Like- I don't know. I think I think you could get either because I've been at concerts before, like um, back home. Like say I went to a Miranda concert in Kansas City and I take some high school friends that are not, have nothing to do with music business. We'll be sitting there and they're just proud of me. So like my, she'll sing one of my songs and we're like, yeah, you know, and they'll like turn around the people behind me like, she wrote that song. Yeah. And they're like, Wait, what? It takes them in to register, and then they get super excited, and then they want to talk. And no, that's awesome. But that's it's it's because they love that. Like mm-hmm. my parents, when I was little, I remember the local newscaster was somebody they went to high school with, and they were just for one of the channels. I don't even know. And they, I remember them talking about how cool that was. Mm. And I so bad for some reason that was the seed that was planted in what I was doing, whether it was politics, whether it was going to be theater or whatever it was that I was going to end up in, I wanted to do something that my hometown would think is really cool. Mm. I don't know why, because I don't go back that often anymore. I've lived in LA for longer than I lived in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't rationally make sense, but you know, my, my the only people on Facebook that see the things that are happening in my life are people that I went to high school with. And and so I think it's cool that when they hear these songs that are on the radio, on the Today Show, in a Walmart commercial, whatever it is, that they can go to their kids and say, oh, I went to high school with that kid. I'm the, I'm the exact same. I have processed it that way, but then I moved on to a new thought, which was I think maybe I'm just trying to impress my child self. You know, or I'm trying to, yeah, I'm living for her. 
more than because I I don't really like when my hometown makes a deal about things like I'm proud to be I'm more proud to be from there from than anybody and I'm super connected and involved we're building a house there and I mean we're gonna go back for a month every summer um but for me I'm uncomfortable when they're like we want to do something in the newspaper about you being nominated for a Grammy I'm like why don't do that no that's uncomfortable for me I I think it I think I finally figured out that I'm just still looking at myself like I'm seven years old and a fan and like impress her, live for her. Cause she didn't think that you, she would have never thought that you could be here. So that's kind of my fuel, I think. Well, I can imagine she's pretty impressed with you right now. Yeah, she probably is. She's probably upset with how much I cuss too. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for doing this. This is so cool. Don't miss the 51st annual CMA Awards tonight at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock Central on ABC. See performances by your favorite artists including Garth Brooks, Carrie Underwood, Luke Bryan, and many more. For more information, visit cmaawards.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us on iTunes. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And the Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. On next episode, we sit down with Ashley Gorley. Carrie Underwood. Oh, life changer for me. For sure. Um, and just perfect, man. What a perfect vocalist and great role model for my daughters and all that stuff. My daughter and everything. Like, So she was she was the first, you know what I mean? As far as me having success like that, having a hit. Um, that was such a cool thing because I was watching. We watched American Idol like routinely. Like we were in on it then, you know, whatever season that was. And so I remember literally saying like, I got to get a song on this girl right here. You know, when she was like barely in the, in the top 10. So to kind of see that all the way through and for that to happen was was insane. So she I mean she's a sweetheart. She's great. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.